Welcome to Prairie Postmodern. I'm your host, Dr. Curtis Collins. This program explores the social, political, and cultural underpinnings of what has come to be known as the postmodern era. That is a condition here in North America which is marked by the advent of space travel, computer technology, and global consumerism. Today on Prairie Postmodern, we meet Regina artist Rob Truskowski. Truskowski is a professor in printmaking at the University of Regina. His work combines both text and image to offer the viewer ambiguous references to contemporary existence. In his prints, Truskowski uses both analog and digital technologies to create sets of hybrid signs. Perhaps we could begin with a discussion of how you conceive and then execute your work. Right. Well, the conception one is uh, it's a bit convoluted and it's a bit confusing and it's a bit all over the place. And I think it's probably born out of the fact that I spend a lot of time on the internet and uh, uh, I teach students that are of the Tumblr generation. So okay. it's all about kind of grabbing uh, information and ideas and images um, and not really being necessarily limited to a thing that I've got in front of me. So in this day and age, the internet is a fantastic tool. So if I want a picture of an Uzi uh, semi-automatic <clears throat> weapon, um, I can find one and I can uh, download it and I can draw it or I can take it into software and digitally separate it. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of where the work comes from more broadly, um, I'm, I'm drawing on a lot of, I think, autobiographical references um, going back as far as uh, my childhood and I'm looking to to take some of those those bits of information those ideas those memories code them often um, and to an extent mash them up put them into my work and have them form conversations that I'm fully aware of but are not necessarily explicit so uh, you know I, I often will provide um, a series of ideas and images and, and textual relationships and um, see what new is generated out of the sum. Now, you have a lot of text in your work. It's quite a regular feature. Where do you pull your text from, and how do you combine it with the image? To be honest with you, I didn't really realize that I had a lot of text in my work um, until uh, I, I looked at Open Studio in Toronto, where I've worked in the past, and they described me as a contemporary text-based printmaker. Oh, and I thought, okay. oh, OK. And then I looked, and I said, wow, everything that I do has text in it. So the text comes from, um, it, it can come from biblical sources, it can come from instruction manuals, it can come from little bit signs that I see out in the world. Um, and increasingly I've begun to trust my instincts around taking snippets out of um, rap music. So, so you know, in a, in a collector's sense, text comes from everywhere. And how does it integrate? Well, sometimes it's, it's purely a formal thing and other times it's, it's leading the charge conceptually in terms of what happens with the rest of the work. So text is, um, yeah, it's, it's ubiquitous in my work and it, there's no one real formula for how it finds its way in there. Now, we've looked at a few of your recent works. Uh, one that comes to mind is that image of the Uzi. Can you talk about that series that you're actually presenting right now at a gallery in Vernon? <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah, the series thing, printmakers, I guess, often think in terms of series and, and the notion of series is usually predicated on um, certain physical constraints. I'm going to work with this kind of paper or in this particular medium. Um, and, the, and kind of going hand in hand with that is the conceptual thing. So what is the work, what is the work about and what does it look like and how does that all kind of, how does that all kind of go together? So I, I don't really think in terms of series per se, but invariably I work uh, in a certain way with a certain thematic in mind. I allow it to kind of become organic and grow and expand and so on. Um, and it usually finds a natural stopping point. And sometimes it's, it's a show. You know, um, the show that I have in Vernon right now for the Okanagan Print Triennial um, has been something I've been working on for more than two years mm -hmm. since this show was kind of placed in front of me. And so um, that's not to say that there's not work happening right now that's, that kind of progresses from that point. But at some point, I guess, the fact that the university semester is just over um, and a number of other things have happened in my personal and professional life, the new baby and all that kind of stuff, it seems like an interesting point to say, well, that is a series. Um, so, so yeah, the series thing is uh, its not nearly as straightforward as, as um, it might look from a distance. Now, the series of prints that you pulled today for us with that sort of pixelated grid, I see that reoccurring. Can you talk about that a bit? 
Sure, yeah. So I, I refer to that as my polyhedron or my polyhedron. So I've got these mathematically generated um, images that, uh, that I then take. Um, they're generated, like I said, mathematically, but then I take them and then I get very intuitive with them. So I work on the computer and I take this image and I and I sit for hours in front of the computer and I separate this image and I look for bits of pixel information or color and all this other kind of complicated stuff. And I pull this in and out and, and, and I reconstitute my imagery in a, in a much more organic fashion than it might seem. It seems very, very kind of linear and straightforward and mathematical, but I do a lot of, I guess, the, the part of me that wants to paint or like brush and move, you know, all and feel and all that kind of stuff can happen there on a computer screen, which might seem contradictory, but, but that's, that's where that, that ball has come from. And so in terms of what the ball means, um, it means a couple of things. But I, uh, initially, it was, um, and I use this to describe it to my students because I was trying to figure it out as well, it's the ball that chases Indiana Jones down at the beginning right? of, of okay. the Indiana Jones movies. Um, and, I th and that was really born out of the fact that I'd been having these weird dreams where I was running and being chased all the time. And I think it had something to do with the fact that like most people who are trying to achieve their goals and successes, um, you end up pushing yourself. You sure. know? So I was being chased down by the specter of tenure at the University of Regina. <laughs> I was being chased down by wanting to have kids and to own a house and to have a car and to allow my wife, who's an artist, to, to be an artist and, and to do all of those kinds of things. So this ball was kind of chasing me down. Um, but then there's this whole notion of how math is, is you know, the universe is sometimes described as, as having math involved in all an things. Equation. An equation or there is some kind of mathematical symmetry or there's a master plan. So the, so the idea of this, this polyhedron is this, <clears throat> this ability to describe the world mathematically, even though it's a, it's a metaphor that I don't think entirely holds up. Um, comes forward, and then when you elevate that, then math becomes this placeholder for God. So the ball is this icon, and it's this God, okay. and it's this sun that provides order to all things. It's this thing that we need and we can't live without, and I guess a complicated bit of relationship that I have with growing up as a Catholic. Um, pushing that aside, trying to decide you know, who I am for myself, trying to decide who my kids are and what right. my life is going to be. So the ball... Um, the ball, the polyhedron, has a whole bunch of meaning for me and s makes me kind of laugh. Uh, and so um, that really is the clincher for why the ball has stuck around. I, I just, I love it and I just think about the ball as this thing and this entity. So. And that idea of multiple reference points you mentioned earlier with the Uzi has to do with your role as a father, but also that influence of rap music. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, well, um, I mean, maybe it is the whole postmodern thing, you know, looking for kind of looking for multiple contexts, multiple vantage points, contesting um, even my own history or my own understanding of things, looking for the structure behind things and looking for ways to take that apart. So the Uzi, um, you know, as you mentioned, it is it is the quintessential, um, you know, the A-team carried around Uzis. Yes. Uh, uh, Uzis and guns and stuff, like little boys. I've got a little boy, and little boys like guns, and they're hitting and smacking and stuff. So there's, there's thinking, I guess, about that and about masculinity, and there's, and there's ideas around, um, I guess, power and authority and who's in charge, and then the rap music thing, which glorifies that and how that's a real problem, but the conflict I have as a decent human being, as a professor, <laughs> as an artist, as a person who has a studio next to a bunch of, uh, a bunch of um, university students is that I blast this music while I'm, while I'm working in here. And um, what, you know, what do those signs and symbols mean? And, and what does that, you know, what are those you know, how do those relationships kind of expand beyond just, it's a gun, it's for shooting? It's a gun, it's for kids, it's a gun, it's for masculinity, it's a gun, it's for glorification of money and cat, you know, the, the whole kind of rap mantra thing. And um, um, so it's complex. And again, it's one of those things that keeps my head spinning and I, and I can't stop thinking about the references that I bring to it. So that's, again, one of those reasons why the Uzi, um, you know, why it showed up in the work and why it took 35 printed layers to make that, you <laughs> okay. know? And for non-print makers, they say, 35 layers, two layers, it doesn't make a difference. But I can tell you that I spent an awful lot of time <laughs> with this image um, and, uh, and deciding what it meant for me, and it continued to kind of unravel a bit like an onion for me in okay. terms of what the meaning was. So. Now, if you step back from your work a, a bit, how do you consider your practice within that postmodern context? Right. Well. <sighs> I mean, I think that there's, there is this, this sense that in my work, um, if you're looking at it 
let's just say purely visually and, and attempting to dissect the bits and pieces that are in it, it looks like I'm drawing from all over the place. So it looks like I'm searching for some kind of connect, connection, some kind of meeting, some kind of underlying structure, but then potentially contesting what that structure is and, and looking for ways in which knowledge is, is kind of generated and regenerated. Mm -hmm. So we, we live in, in a, very much in a postmodern, but potentially a post postmodern. I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really thought of myself as one or the other or the other really since I was in grad school, when we ask our students yes, to do this. Yeah. And we, we, you know, we really want them to think about who they are and where they come from and what they bring to their work. So, so the, the kind of postmodern context, I guess when I look back at it and I started thinking about what it could possibly mean, um, and when I read from academic books about what postmodern meant, and then when I went on Wikipedia, and then when I went on the Urban <laughs> Dictionary, you know, okay. like, um, th that I think is really a metaphor for, for the way in which I bring information and ideas and knowledge together in my work. Um, I, can, I can pull it from all kinds of different sources, and ultimately I have to figure out how to curate it or edit it or funnel it or um, you know, make it kind of reconstitute itself. And there's, there's lovely metaphors there in terms of the, the physical nature of printmaking, what it is to be a printmaker, the kind of social and historical and economic and commercial and technical baggage that printmakers bring with us when we work. Um, it, you know, we can get caught looking at our belly button, thinking about what it is that we do and why, you know, why we use that kind of mark and what kind of ink and oh my god, and printmakers <laughs> get together. But um, that's really only one part of what it is t to make my work, and I think that that, you know, is really kind of a suitable, uh, kind of a suitable metaphor for what it is that I do as an artist. Truskowski's prints are influenced by the endless number of pictures and phrases that circulate around us on a daily basis. He embraces the happy accidents that occur during the transfer of digital applications to screen printing methods. This artist often seeks to create a tension between words and images that are indicative of the social, political, and economic contradictions of the 21st century.